So you've been at this for quite a while. Um, and one of the things I always love to ask people like you who are world-class creatives is how the heck you got started. Because I feel like getting started in, in your field is like the hardest thing in the world. <laughs> you know, like, like you, you grow no up in joke. kids. Yeah. Like you, you go to the local high school. Yeah. Um, you know, in your case, I think you attended NYU for a minute and then dropped out uh, to pursue comedy. Uh, I, I want to say. Yeah. I mean, being Latin back then and being wanting to be an actor was, was not the most successful looking choice because, you know, they just didn't cast us. They didn't cast us no matter what. We were always cast it out, you know, uh, never made it, you know, like all my white friends that were at NYU studying acting, were going to like five editions a day. I was going to one every five months. So I saw, wow. I saw, I saw you must have felt that so acutely because you're in this program and you're like, wait a minute. Like, you know, that like, like there just aren't as many roles. That's fascinating. That's crazy. Yeah. And I was able to see it firsthand. I was going, wow, why, why don't I have the same options? I studied like them. I have the same grades. I studied with better acting teachers than they did. I studied with Herbert Berghoff and Lee Strasberg. Why don't I have the same opportunities? But it's because of the way I look and my name. And uh, that came, you know, became a realization really fast. And then I knew, you know, I started to learn that, wow, this is, this is going to be very difficult. And I, I need to find other ways to, to stay, you know, sane and, and stay creative. So I started writing because that's one place nobody could stop me. You know, nobody could tell me no or, or, or exclude wow. me. So the stuff you started writing initially, was it comedy? Was it jokes? Like, what did yeah. you start out writing? Was, yeah, I, you know, I was writing jokes in high school because I had a very competitive comedy table at lunch and you couldn't sit at the table unless you had the best jokes. And if you didn't have them the day before, you weren't allowed to sit at the table. So it was mad competitive. So I used to have to write jokes to, to be able to win because you can't just, you know, be improvising. You're not going to come up with the top joke. So, yes, yeah, so I started writing then. And then by the time I graduated college, I started uh, writing uh, sort of uh, characters, sketches. You know, uh, I was doing improv at First Amendment, which was this big uh, downtown improv comedy group. That was huge. You know, Bruce Willis went there. Robin Williams would come there. And, you know, and, and, and a lot of co- comedians would come there and steal jokes, too. That, that was a, rea- a real thing I learned, too. I mean, some of your jokes, they probably couldn't steal because it wouldn't make sense for them because I'm sure some of them had to do with being Latino. <laughs> yeah, but people, people, are, people are clever, though. Comedians are clever. They don't, don't know how to flip a joke. <laughs> don't make uh, it fit. So you're scrapping and clawing for a while in the New York comedy scene. Like, when did you feel like, OK, like this is going to work? I, you know, like I, I'm going to make it uh, where you started having like uh, some success and getting cast in various roles. Like what, what, what would you consider your own breakout? My breakthrough moment uh, when everything just fell into place was when I did my first one man show called Mama Mouth in 1990. And, uh, you know, they didn't really believe in my show. They kind of believed in my show but not really, because <laughs> I was in the hallway of the theater. I wasn't even in the theater. I was in the hallway of the theater with a makeshift platform, 70 fold up seats that they would pick up at eight o'clock when the real show started. And, and I had to be God, you know, all my audience had to be cleared out, but you know, the reviews came in and, you know, they were banging, you know, it, it, it and, and all of a sudden in, in this 70 fold up seats was Al Pacino, uh, John F. K. Wow. Jr. Uh, wow. uh, Olympia Dukakis, Raul Julia, Sam Shepard, Arthur Miller, uh, John Malkovich. It was incredible, man. And, and that, that's when everything started to change because I think, I learned, the audience was learning, the industry was learning. Wow, Latin content is valuable. Latin content is for everybody. Latin people want to see Latin people. And Latin people definitely want to see themselves. So it, it was a breakthrough moment culturally. It must have been such a small venue, too, where you could literally see their faces. You'd be looking yeah. at them and be like, hey, look. <laughs> it's it would make me nervous. Like, it would make me ner- I, get, I would get nervous sometimes because my, my sight was good then. And I could see those faces. And sometimes, you know, they're not... They, they, they're looking at you, but they're getting tired or sleepy or, or whatever. I don't know. They had a rough oh, night. Yeah, yeah. You know, you see all that. People yawn sometimes, you know. You, 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 it, sometimes I'm glad now that I can't see because all the audience looks like they're, they're really just loving it. I'm going to tell a random story from running for president. That's like my parallel. And, you know, like, I, you know, it's a little bit later on or whatnot. Yeah. 
Um, but you you have a town hall in New Hampshire, and you can see everyone's face. So so there there's like this like real like yeah. you kind of know if it's going well or not. It's one reason why you see these various political figures be like, okay, like change it up because you you see what's working and what's not working. And then I look out there, and then it's like Paul Giamatti sitting there, and then I get distracted. I'm like, oh shit, Paul Giamatti's <laughs> like it's too much. Too much. New Hampshire. <laughs> and, then, and then you like block it out and just continue saying what you're saying. But then there's like part of you that just wanted to stop and be like, hey, you know, like right, right. of yours from you know, like what you know, whatever movie I saw you in. Um, Especially when you see your heroes, it's like when I saw Pacino, I was like, you know, I I I, I heard myself stammer because here's your hero watching you perform. It's 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 a little too much. You know, I mean, it's a little too much. Well, in your case, it must have felt like such an incredible vindication or knighting where like they're like kind of letting you in the club where like some people who are heroes of yours who are world class New York creatives actually took time out, saw your show. And then you get all these great reviews for the material. I can see why you're like, wow, you know, like uh, like this is working. And you were what, 26 at the time. Is that right? Yeah, I was 26. And uh yeah, they gave me the confidence to keep going. And then, boom, I wrote my next show, Spicarama. And uh, I won Best Play of 1992 at the Warner Hall uh, Award. And, uh, you know, those those little wins were really important to me because it, it fueled me. You know, it fueled me. And, and then when my show, Mamba Mouth, hit HBO, then the Latin audience found me. And they would go everywhere. I went Chicago, San Francisco, Texas, wherever I would go, there was a huge Latin audience to be had. And, you know, they just made a church, you know, it would, they would be call and response and yelling and hooting, hollering, and it became electric. That's beautiful. You must have felt so welcomed by the uh, Latino community uh, the whole time, because you are one of the most prominent voices uh, in, in my mind in, in the industry. And when you got started, there was probably a, a massive void or vacuum you were filling you know, one of the things that reminds me of a little bit is I have some folks who are uh, Asian American creatives yeah. and whatnot. And and some of them also talked about like, hey, I, I only got get cast as the waiter, the gangster, like the <laughs> you know, right, right. Like whatever like the Asian American roles are. I know. I, 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 BD Wong used to tell me about those stories, you know, like here's this massively talented young man. And, you know, his opportunities are nil, you know, he's just waiting for that perfect Asian role to come along. You know, I love the way um, Whoopi Goldberg did it. Like when she hit stardom, because she was also a big influence for me. Brilliant, brilliant performer. I saw that her show that Mike Nichols directed on Broadway was life changing for me. But she had them change white roles and male roles to make them a black woman. Just take any script and boom, she, her, her recipe was just make it a black woman. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, Whoopi Goldberg, that's right. Just make it a black woman. That's a pretty good system. You know, I think people who are listening to this would be like, yeah, let's just like make, make this into yeah. an Asian I mean, dude. <laughs> right, because Hollywood <laughs> didn't understand. Hollywood didn't understand how to write for a black woman. They didn't know how to create that uh, farm to create product for her. So she said, just take a goddamn regular motherfucking script and make it about a black woman. It just, and, and it worked, it worked. Yeah, Whoopi and I became friends over the last number of months, um, you know, uh, through through The View uh, during the presidential. She's been great. Um, she's awesome. She and I got into a lot of trouble uh, <laughs> when, I, when Al Gore was running for president. She and I did the DNC and both of us had raunchy, raunchy material. And, and we got the DNC in so much trouble because both of us, for some reason, <laughs> decided to go like blue and rogue at the same time. And it was too much. Yeah, they couldn't handle it. People are color going, <laughs> going rogue. That's really funny. Much. Those are different times too. And at, oh, when, yeah. when you show up in person to the DNC, uh, it was a, probably a very, very boring crew because I've been to these DNC things, and <laughs> like, like, yeah, it's not exactly dry, a place for yeah, not exactly a place for edgy oh, humor. Oh no, no, it was so wrong. But I learned. I learned. I, I never did. Yeah, next, I, th I think I did the John Kerry one, and I just really toned it down. <laughs> that, that, that's really funny. You were like, I'm just going to play this one right up the middle. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, I know. It wasn't a place to be wrong. She was like, oh, my bad. I read the room wrong. <laughs> I remember when um, I was meant to speak at the, the DNC uh, convention this past year. And you actually feel a bit of pressure because you're like, well, the ratings for this are going to be sky high. And, you know, you, you were mm -hmm. very, very tightly controlled in terms of time. Right. Um, and, and so we had a speech that we prepared 
And then they gave notes. And the only notes they gave, John, were just trying to cut words. <laughs> They're just trying oh, to like make stuff shorter. It's yeah, just yeah. like whatever it is, is make it short. Like substance, like they were cool with the substance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and and then uh, they had me into practice the, the DNC speech, which is a weird feeling because you're like practicing speaking to the American people. And they also tell you that, hey, if there's any technical difficulty, we're just going to play this recording. <laughs> so, right. so, you're, so it was like a weird dress rehearsal where you're like, all right, like, well, let, let me like, um, you know, give, give five me my people best. In the house. Yeah, let me rub five people in the house as I'm talking to America and then be prepared to be cut out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like that, that's what it was. And then like time passed and it was like the real one. And um, it, it was it was from a studio in New York in that case. And it was like uh, me and Cory Booker were in the same studio. So we were um, sharing some time and shooting the shit. Uh, how, how great backstage. is he, man? Isn't Cory great? I mean, he's got such a great vibe. He's a great guy.